uh, referring to my slides, but I won't be covering everything in the material. So please feel free to uh, to download that and uh, uh, and we'll see if we can make it possible for people to download. I guess not. I don't know. That's a shame. Um, so thank you all for for coming. I've been at a lot of wonderful sessions today. I really have enjoyed and learned a lot. And I've been in a lot of the reduced sections just by happenstance. Uh, and here we are once again, and I'm gonna talk about reducing grading. That is to say, reducing the percentage, um, the number of materials that we do formal grading as instructors for students in our courses as a way of embracing this notion of ungrading. So a new way of thinking about, about assessment and detaching assessment from grading. First, I want to acknowledge that the land, this land that the University of Toronto operates has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful uh, for the chance to work on this land. So my quick overview is that I wanna talk a little bit about uh, why we grade um, and then move to this notion of ungrading. So the idea of detaching assessment from grading um, and um, transforming extrinsic motivations into intrinsic motivations for our students. I will talk a little bit about some of the general practices that come under this rubric of ungrading and then tell you a bit about my own experiment, which I did this past year uh, given the uh, strange circumstances we found ourselves in, I, uh, I decided to try something that I've been thinking about quite a bit, and, uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about that before concluding. So I begin with the question, why do we grade? Um, why do we uh, grade is based on a, a lot of different factors. There is, of course, historical precedent. The use of number or letter grading apparently has only been in existence for about 100 plus years, but there have been forms of, um, of ranking and so on in universities for much, much longer. Um, while uh, there are different modes of, of using the formal uh, letter and number grading systems, they differ. So there isn't one particular way, obviously, there are many different ways, but it has become ubiquitous, of course, in um, uh, institutions of higher education. And we presume there is value in this, of course. There is um, ideas about ranking students um, in, in terms of their various achievement. Uh, we, the grades apparently give students a sense of their progression and gives us a sense of their progression and improvement uh, at achievement over the course of perhaps a program or a degree. Um, and there are uh, no doubt other values that we can talk about uh, at, in the discussion. There are, of course, uh, institutional expectations around grading. This is one of the reasons why we grade is that we are required to grade. And uh, as we all know, there are policies in place about getting graded materials back to students before the drop date and, and so on and so forth. Um, there are more policies than that, but I just wanted to point that one out as if we all needed to be reminded of that. Um, so there are institutional expectations, but of course there are also expectations from students. Students have been conditioned to expect these types of markers and measures of their work and their achievement since uh, they started schooling. Report cards in, in primary school, junior school, and then uh, grades in high school, possibly number or letter grades in high school. So they're very much um, uh, habituated to this idea that they that the, the the measure of their success is in grading. Now there are problems with grading um, and I want to talk a little bit about them through the lens of the people who are thinking about this whole notion called ungrading. So one of the mainstays of, of thinking about ungrading so that is to say reducing or even removing the uh, amount of uh, formal uh, instructor assessed grading in a class comes under the heading of the simple idea, uh, simple yet revolutionary idea that grading does not equal assessment. Now, I'm sure we all know that to one degree or another, 
Um, I'm not sure students know that sometimes because as I'm sure you all have all experienced, if we give them lengthy assessment uh, feedback and a grade, they tend to focus right in on the grade and may not even read the feedback, which is the, the formative assessment that we're giving them or summative assessment that we're giving them. But the system, of course, reinforces this idea that grading is uh, assessment or is an, an essential uh, form of assessment. But, and given this idea about the importance of grades, um, there are what we would have to say are expected outcomes from this reality. That is to say that grades as an extrinsic motivation will uh, typically lessen students' interests in the work that they're doing because it's being uh, entirely imposed, if you will, upon them. It doesn't tend to generate intrinsic interest in the material. And that means that learning uh, is measurably decreased. So there's been a lot of qualitative and quantitative studies about the impact of extrinsic motivation versus intrinsic motivation on the learning and retention of material that students have. And lastly, one of the other expected outcomes of grades is that give, if grades are the most important part uh, or perceived important part of, of uh, getting through school successfully, is that students may opt for easier options in order to get the grades that they need or want, which may not mean that they're learning um, more. So they may be taking the easy road. So Alfie Cohn, who wrote this wonderful book called Punished by Rewards, which is all about ungrading, says that, of course, one way to avoid these outcomes is to avoid grading, is to replace grading um, and use uh, other intrinsic or to encourage other intrinsic forms of motivation to get students engaged in their work, uh, to give them rich feedback, and not to resort to what he calls um, punishment through rewarding them by, by letter grades. Now, his work, um, uh, as I said, includes a lot of qualitative and quantitative research. Um, one of the most important studies that sort of got us on the road to thinking about ungrading is uh, the wor work by Ruth Butler, who talks, who has done studies uh, with, with students, particularly primary age students, on the importance of encouraging intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic measures such as grading. And that has these, her work has been peer assessed and um, replicated numerous times at the primary the secondary and now even at the tertiary level that those types of intrinsic motivations are highly formative for students. Um, another element of ungrading is that it isn't uh, it is about inviting students into the assessment process. So it isn't simply the student performs by creating an assignment and then the instructor performs by creating a grade or and with feedback, but rather inviting students into the assessment process by a number of different means. So those are some of the, the, the key elements of what ungrading is all about. Now, the practices of ungrading are many. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you have them on the handout. Uh, when I began researching for this experiment, I was pleased to learn that, in fact, I had already been ungrading, and perhaps some of you already have been as well. For example, I've created grade-free zones in some of my classes. Um, that is to say, elements of the classes that are um, pass-fail. So discussion posts and other pre-class exercises that I do every week uh, will be pass-fail rather than graded. I also make regular use of things like peer assessment to give, again, rich feedback to students as they form uh, their work along the way uh, without assigning a grade. Um, these uh, and other things are a part of ungrading. So I had already been doing it and that was pleasing, but then I realized that I needed to do more if I wanted to make this a more fulfilling experience for myself and my teachers, uh, my students, Freudian slip. Um, so I embraced things like self-assessment. So inviting students to, meta to reflect not just on their learning, which I had always, always done through critical incident questionnaires, but on their actual assignments. So they would complete self-assessments after each assignment and uh, write process letters about how they feel they're doing in their work throughout the semester. 
So I had already been doing it. Um, I did some research and decided to design into a course this, that just ended this past semester uh, to try uh, a fully ungraded course. Now it's a small course, so I recognize it isn't um, per perhaps an ideal uh, setting. Uh, it's also a humanities course, which I recognize might uh, have different affordances uh, in, uh, in terms of numbers and other things. Um, but um, but I assure you that there, there's plenty of research on using ungrading in STEM courses, large courses, small courses, and, and otherwise. But this course was a seminar course called The World of World Religions. I teach in the study, Department for the Study of Religion, and it's a capstone course that invites students to look back over their uh, their major specialist and to think about the um, the idea of the world religions paradigm, which is sort of undergirds all of the introductory courses and many of the uh, traditions based courses that we teach and to uh, to actually try to think of new ways of introducing people to the study of religion. So in this this seminar uh, with 11 students, they had to write two response papers. They had weekly discussion board assignments. They led uh, the seminar for at least one uh, once a week, uh, excuse me, one week per, per semester. Uh, then they proposed uh, a new course. And then finally, the last three weeks of the class was them presenting their fully conceived models for a new course, which included uh, rubric, um, not a rubric, sorry, a syllabus, selected readings, and uh, a close look at at least one week of material. They were wonderful. Um, so the assessments that I did uh, for in the course, so those were the requirements. Now the assessments included peer and self-assessment. So we started with doing a benchmarking session together. I gave them um, a, a model response paper on something that they too were reading, and we all graded it together so that we got a sense of what grades mean. And then when they did their own response papers, they did first, they did their uh, peer assessment of each other in order to get a lot of feedback. Um, and then they wrote up their own self-assessment and I gave them my formative feedback on their response paper in order to then enhance their, their work on their next response paper. They also had lots of engagement with each other on their posts weekly. Uh, it was a highly engaged group of discussants in the uh, seminar. So there was a lot of feedback about ideas and so on. Uh, around the table, so to speak, uh, during the seminar. Um, and then when the, after they had done their uh, pr final presentations, the students gave them feedback in written form. And, and a week later, they were uh, required to do their own self-assessment. And then at the end of the semester, they did a self-assessment for the whole course. And I should hasten to add, they were... Um, assigning themselves nominal grades for these things. So it wasn't an ungraded course in, that, in, a, in, in a purist sense. There were grades, but the students were assessing themselves and assigning themselves grades. Um, and I contracted with them that I would not lower their grades, but I had it within my discretion to raise them if I felt that they weren't being sufficiently um, um, generous with their grading. So I gave the final grade, of course, uh, that is the policy of the university. And uh, I also gave them extensive summative feedback in the form of writing uh, at the end of the semester. So the self-assessment, uh, uh, this is just an example of the self-assessment tool that, that I developed from a model from my colleague, Francis Garrett. Um, asks the students to describe their work, their work on their peer assessment, their attitudes to their work, the time that they developed and, and so on before giving themselves a grade and arguing for the grade. And if I disagreed with the argument, I would meet with them. As it turns out, I didn't have to. In the early grades, uh, a self-assigned, uh, which were the two response papers, uh, there was a full range, a full spectrum, uh, not a full spectrum, but uh, for a senior seminar, a, a broad range uh, of uh, a distribution of grades. And, um, and those improved on the second round, which again would be expected uh, in, a, in a, a course like this. 
And what was, of course, most delightful was that they didn't all give themselves A pluses and they didn't all give themselves B minuses. They really did reflect clearly on their work. And um, there was this 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 great distribution. And that took a lot of pressure off me uh, because I realized I could trust them. Uh, and apparently they could trust themselves. In the final self-assessment, again, we had a bit of a range that reflected, um, the, I think, reflected well the work. I do note, however, that there were two students that I felt did better than they themselves felt they did. So I raised their grades, um, you know, essentially by two grades, two letter, two, two points. And there was one that I might have lowered, uh, but um, it was uh, really only a minor discrepancy, again, of two points. So a full range, uh, again, for a senior seminar. Now, overall, uh, I have on the next few slides, uh, which I'm not going to read from, um, you, uh, comments from the students. Overall, it was a very positive experience. They um, appreciated uh, the, uh, the, lack of the lack of stress uh, that they felt once they got over the intimidation, sort of like, what is this? Uh, a lot of students reported feeling liberated uh, relieved. Uh, they appreciated, as one notes here, uh, uh, having the peer assessment as a, a way into the self-assessment process. Um, that one student commented on how exceptionally well everybody seemed to be performing. And, you know, anecdotally, one wonders if that isn't because they didn't feel that they had to perform for a grade. They were actually just learning and enjoying that process. Um, one of the issues, of course, that I worried about and talked to students about at the outset was imposter syndrome, that they might not assign themselves high enough grades. Um, but I think overall they did a good job and those that struggled uh, said as much in terms of struggling to give themselves a grade. Uh, most of, I think the thing that I uh, want to highlight mostly to, to take away from that was this idea of the confidence that students got from this work, that they learned more about themselves as learners and scholars. They learned to trust their own judgment. And, um, and even though there was a temptation to lower their grades, for example, um, they, they learned to resist that and to actually embrace what they understood to be uh, higher quality work. So in terms of the lessons learned from this experiment, um, the first thing, the lesson learned is that I, I want to keep doing it because I found it extremely gratifying. I, I felt that I could trust the students. Uh, they apparently felt they could trust me and then they learned to trust themselves. So it was a really a, a beautiful experience actually. And by the end of it, um, I was on the verge of tears saying goodbye because I so enjoyed working with them. It was such a unique experience, even with the distance of online, uh, we still had a real uh, a sort of touching closeness with one another. Uh, but what I would do uh, differently next time is to give more information about the experiment at the outset. Now, of course, I, this was my first time, so I couldn't do more. Um, and I, uh, I, but now I have more that I can give them. I would invite more self-assessment along the way than I did. I wouldn't just tie it to assignments. I would tie it more to just progress through the course. And I would be more transparent up front, uh, not just about imposter syndrome as a vague notion, but about the reality of gendered and racialized practices in assessment and self-assessment. So they have perhaps internalized some discrepancies uh, according to their identities. And I think that was, uh, I would be really upfront about that because the two students whose grades I raised were uh, female identified. Uh, for the final grades, and in the couple of cases where I gr raised grades and along the way, they were racialized students. So I think it's important to be really clear about that. So in answer to my question, uh, can ungrading be a mainstay of assessment? I think yes. <laughs> uh, given the research, and there is a growing amount of research on these types of practices and the results that I had, I certainly believe that ungrading is a useful and accessible practice. I would, uh, again, begin small and work uh, up to expanding that. 
Uh, but I, of course, I caution that there are institutional factors to discuss, the program policies, department policies, faculty policies, and so on. This isn't something that one can just do without cons consultation, and I intend to do that with my department uh, as I move forward. And then I would just say, reiterate what I mentioned earlier, is that this is not just for small seminars and humanities courses. This is being done in large courses, in STEM courses. Um, there's a, a lot of bibliography, which I have on my last slide. And I invite you to take a look at, particularly at the book, Why Ungrade, uh, sorry, The Ungrading, uh, edited by Susan, Susan Bloom, which gathers together a number of different case studies. And with that, I will, stop and uh, invite your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris. This was, I, I anticipate there will be lots of questions. There are a lot of things to think about. So wonderful. Idea.